Welcome to Friends in Fiction, five best-selling authors and the stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, Patty Callahan Henry, and Mary Alice Monroe are five longtime friends with more than 80 published books to their credit. In 2020, they created Friends in Fiction to provide author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing, and to highlight independent bookstores. These friends discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Thank you for joining us on a special Sunday for a behind the book episode of Friends in Fiction. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey, and I will be your host today. I'm Patty Callahan Henry. I'm Mary Alice Monroe. I'm Mary Kay Andrews. I'm Kristen Harmel. And this is Friends in Fiction. Today, we are so excited to talk to our friend Anne Garvin, the USA Today best selling author of the brand new. I thought you said this would work, which I absolutely adored, by the way. She's also the founder of the amazing group, The Tall Poppy Writers, of which I'm a proud member. So today we are going to talk to her not only about her new novel, but also about how collaboration with other women writers has helped shape her career. Indeed. But before we start, we let's mention a big thank you to Mama Geraldine's. When I'm on the road promoting the Islanders, I always have those Mama G's in the car with me to snack <laughs> on. So remember, as always, use the code FAB5 to get 20% off at mamageraldines.com. So snack on, y'all. Uh, and you know that supporting independent booksellers is at the heart of what we do. This week, we're supporting a favorite of ours, Blue Bicycle Books in beautiful downtown Charleston, South Carolina, where you can get 10% off all our new releases with the code FRIENDS. But for now, we are so excited to welcome our charming, hilarious, witty, <laughs> endearing. I have all of the adjectives for Ann Garvin. I just mm -hmm. adore her. Mm -hmm. She, um, and if you don't follow her on social media, she is hilarious and will hilarious. brighten every single day. Mm -hmm. Ann Garvin is a PhD, um, so she's a total slacker. <laughs> and the USA, she just did, she didn't do that well in school, so we yeah. had to bag it off. She is the USA Today bestselling author of I Thought You Said This Would Work, which released on May in May of 2021. I like you just fine when you're not around. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> great title. title. Yes. The Dog Year, which I know Mary Alice will probably love. Oh, and, yeah. on, and on Maggie's Watch. She is in the process of writing Falling in Love is the Easy Part, mm -hmm. which is another killer title, which will launch in 2022. Anne has said, I write about women with a good sense of humor who do too much in a world that asks too much from them. Wow. In other words, she writes about all of us. I love That's that. Right. Yeah. So smart. I knew we could be besties, Anne. Um, yeah. <laughs> worked as an RN and after receiving her PhD, she taught exercise physiology, sport, psychology, nutrition, stress management, and global health for 30 years in the University of Wisconsin system. <coughs> Sorry, it must be that good food that I've been eating. It's the mama G's. Yeah, it's the mama G's. Yeah. I'm eating them all the time. <laughs> um, she currently teaches at Drexel University in their low residency. MFA program and has held positions at Miami University and Southern New Hampshire in their Masters of Fine Arts Creative Writing programs. And of course, as we um, alluded, Anne is the founder of the multiple award-winning Tall Poppy Writers, where she is committed to helping women writers succeed. Which is so super cool. Madison Magazine said, USA Today's best-selling author and Tall Poppy Writers founder, Anne Garvin, is a lot like the heroines in her novel, plucky and flawed, charming and fiercely loyal, funny to beat the band, even or especially <laughs> when the music gets dark. Yeah. That's hysterical. <laughs> I love it. Well, Sean, let's bring her on. Hi, Hi Anne. Anne. Hi, Anne. Hi, Anne. Hi, Anne. 
We I, are glad, glad. I'm really glad I wasn't there for the intro. <laughs> 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 yes, I'm like embarrassed. <laughs> and we're so thrilled you're here. Thank you for joining us tonight. You were um, one of my very first author friends, and I have been so grateful for your friendship and guidance over these past few years. And Anne, we are so excited to have you here tonight to celebrate your new novel. I thought you said this was would work, was just released in May, and has been a big success. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Yes. It's um, you know, it's a road trip story, um, but it's a road trip story with people that don't really like each other. And, <laughs> you know, I I don't love a road trip, and um, I just kept thinking, what would be worse than a road trip? And that would be if you were stuck in a car with two people that you didn't love and that you had some problems with, and then you shoved a big dog on top of it all. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Oh, I love that. So. Christy mentioned that, you know, the friendship that the two of you had was something that was meaningful to her in the early part of her career and still meaningful to her. Um, and, you know, one of my favorite parts of this story is how beautifully you capture female friendship, with, which obviously with everything you've done with the tall poppy writers is something you know well. Can you tell us a little bit about the friendships in this book? And are there friendships that you drew on for inspiration? Yeah. So I, I, friendship is very important to me. Women I mean, all kinds of friendship, but women friendship, particularly because we all seem to speak the same language and we all have similar, you know, travails. Yeah. So I, I really wanted to pick um, sort of a universal idea of friendship, you know, people that have gone way back in time together, but then maybe didn't have some rough roads that maybe they didn't necessarily know what happened. And years ago, I lost a really good friend. And Oh. I never really understood what happened, and I um, I never had a chance to make it right, except that this past year I did, because of the book, I did sort of search her out, because I thought, this is kind of dumb. I'm going to find out what happened. Oh. And I wrote to her, she lives in Australia, and I wrote to her, and I said, so, I said, I just have this feeling, like, what happened between us? And she was like, nothing. <laughs> um, I was like, oh, 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 wow. I, I think something, I mm, I think something happened and she um, she didn't want to talk about it. So I just let it go at that point. And I'll never know. But just this idea of uh, for me, like friendships are like so important to me and mm. I'm really hard to offend, like, super yeah. hard to offend. So when when there is something that happens in a relationship, I'm a little clueless at first. And then mm. I I can't really believe that there's a problem. So I wanted to write about from those two points of views, both the offended, you know, and the offending. Yeah. Wow. Oh, I love that idea. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. Well, it's a really great story. It's one that drew me in right away. And so sticking to that friendship theme, um, you, like the four of us, the five of us, how many of us are there? The four of you <laughs> and me. The four other than you. Five of us. We we don't all have PhDs like Anne. Math is so right. I both know that math is not my strong suit. Why? <laughs> it's okay. She's all our right. school bow, y'all. That is true. <laughs> you should be, be very afraid. Be oh very gosh. very afraid. But. <laughs> Um, you learned very early on that friendships could be really crucial to your career. And um, I just have to tell everyone this because it's kind of an embarrassing story about me. That's but a good story. Yeah, it's a good story. But the first time I met Anne was at the first writer's conference that I had ever been to. And it was writers and editors and <laughs> agents and you know, everyone in the writing world kind of all together at one of these conferences. And I sat down at a table and Anne had a name tag on. Um, and we'll have to back up. So my first manuscript, Dear Carolina, was under, it was like in the final stage of that like editorial review meeting thing at Berkeley, mm -hmm. at part of Penguin. And so I sit down at this table and Anne introduces herself and she has on this name tag and it says Anne Garvin, Berkeley. And I was like, oh my God, have you read my book? <laughs> <laughs> she was like, um, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. I'm not really sure. And I was like, no, no, no. Like it's like people are reading it at Berkeley right now. And she goes, Oh, I'm a writer for Berkeley, not an editor for Berkeley. And I was oh, like, Oh my face. That is so oh, that's awesome. It was, and you all know me. Like I'm not, 
That is not super like in character for me to like accost someone about are you reading my book right now? Like that's just not that's me an indicator. Come on, Christy, you accosted me totally. I totally did. I totally did. But not about it's that but, first blush when you're a new author. Also. It wasn't about but I wasn't asking you about my book. I was asking you about yours. Now that is in character. <laughs> Oh, well, I think there that, you, you know, it shows sort of the, <laughs> the like my, so my friend, um, Jackie Michard, she's a good friend of mine. And she always says to me, awesome. and could you just be a little pleased and not so eager? And I can't, like, I can't. <laughs> so, like, I love that. I know. Yeah. It's like a thing I should have tattooed, be pleased, not eager, but I can only ever manage eager. And when, so when Chrissy came to me, I was like, Oh, and look at her skin, and she's so pretty. <laughs> we did the same thing. I know. For the longest time, I was like, her skin is like sparkly pudding. And so like, she was like, oh, oh, was like, oh my God. I'm like, your skin. Like, where is that from? We've well, even tried her cream. It does. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She, we literally did, all of us. We don't we love it, Christy. It. It's well, weird. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently my, it's my, not working on my health. Now we yeah. know why she still allowed me to be a tall poppy writer, even though I was a borderline <laughs> lunatic. Um, With your skin. Yeah. So that's that's what that nice. was. Um, no, but anyway, that was so fun. I loved meeting you and you were so nice to include me. You were one of the first people I think that I told I got a book deal, which is kind of fun. Awesome. Um, and you asked yeah. me to be a tall poppy. Yeah, I was trying to think when... So it had to have been way after that that I you came in because I didn't start the tall poppies until I don't know 2000 well 2012 but I'm not sure when that conference was so well it was in 2014 I think but um, wow. that brings me oh, to the question that I'm like getting to in a really long drawn out way <laughs> is how did the poppies start like can you tell us a little bit about you know what happened yeah so I well first of all. You know, my book came out, I had pneumonia, and my divorce came through on the same day. Oh. And I was sitting oh in a chair going, and, and and you know, like I was I was in Wisconsin, I didn't have any author friends, I didn't have any connection to the publishing world, I, I didn't have anyone to sort of be like, oh, your book, yay! And, and so I, I was like, is this what it's like to have a book come out? Like, I thought I was going to be Anita Shreve. Like, I, you get a book come out, you get a, <laughs> a book house, you buy sunglasses, you're good. And all I had was pneumonia. And so I, I am never going to make it. Like, there's no, there's not oh going to be gosh. a year after this. There's, I can't even get on the front page of my tiny little hometown newspaper. So I thought. Uh, there's got to be a way, there's got to be some way to make a splash. And, you know, this was, so I guess it was probably 2013, 2012 when I started. And authors, like the self-published crowd, they really knew what they were doing as far as social media and selling books. But I don't think the traditional publishing authors really mm -hmm. knew that much about it. Like, I think barely people had a Twitter, you know, yeah. presence. Um, yeah. And I thought, well, how am I going to do this? And and then I just started thinking about the way that bands do it, you know, that they sort of help each other. There's always an opening band with a larger band, but I didn't have a band. So I literally, whenever I would meet an author, I'd be like, hi, I want to get a nice group of authors together so we can all talk about our books. And sometimes they'd be like, okay. And other people would be like, I want, no. <laughs> <laughs> Back off. And so, and then I. But you're impossible to offend, fortunately. I am very <laughs> There is no doubt. I'm very hard because I'm so eager. Like, I, it takes me a while. So, um, I asked a couple of authors from Aaron Salello and Susan Glass, and they were like, This is a great idea. We're pregnant. And I thought, Oh, no. <laughs> So it took a few, you know, it took a lot of Olympic long. Oh um, my gosh. But that's why I started it because I just thought I'm never going to have, there's no way I'm going to have a career that I, I can, yes. four people read my books and then my parents died and that left too. So, you know, yeah. I really felt like I needed to do something bigger. And then also the other piece of it too, is that this was a time when people were still talking about how only 
you know, men were reviewed in the New York Times and most of the prizes mm -hmm. were going to men. And yeah. it's not really like I thought I needed a prize, but that was really clear that men were getting all of the yeah. information yeah. or getting all the accolades. And yet women are the readers and women are the writers for the most part. It drove me absolutely crazy. So I thought yeah. the only thing that's going to save women's voices is if women band together like you guys have. Because there's, yeah. it's just too hard to do it, especially when you're doing the labor of the home and the children and everything else. Yep. So yep. I, it was, it's much a feminist kind of like, come on, ladies, as much as it was. Band I mean, together. I love that. I yeah. love it. And band together. Yeah. So we, we often joke <clears throat> that we're a girl band. So yeah. <laughs> now it makes sense why. And you know, when it comes to writers banding together, you realized it way early on and you just explained why. But can you talk to us about how the poppies were instrumental with your last launches and and maybe even with your writing? Because during the pandemic, we were all scrambling yeah. to figure out how to band together and stay sane. And you had this group like just sitting there. You, it, it already existed. So how did that help with your launches and your writing? Well, you know, I think it did help a lot, especially with, um, I like you just fine when you're not around because we were full force then. And yeah. and right around the time when that book came out was when poppies were really getting their act together. And so we, we were able to kind of get that to the USA Today bestseller list. I was gonna say, I like really remember being like, this is, this is happening. Yeah. This is yeah. happening. Mm -hmm. We're doing this. Yeah. And it did. Like we, I yeah. had a a a price break, and then we engineered it to move to up the scales. Like it was awesome. a very interesting thing to see. Um, and then you know, it took me. A, then I, my parents were sick, and I had to care for my mom, and I had to care for my dad, and a whole bunch of things slowed me down towards my next book. Mm -hmm. But during that time, you know, being amidst a bunch of other writers that were some were struggling and others were successful for me just felt like I was still swimming in the sea yeah. like mm -hmm. I didn't yeah. feel like I dropped out of the ocean and I was because I would imagine if you don't have that and no one's sort of cheering for you yeah. it's really easy to be like oh it's yeah. too hard to give up yeah 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 that makes sense so it helped me a lot and um but we did like the poppies have really gone through a change because the pandemic knocked a bunch of us out um, I wow. think that, yeah, I think that, you know, uh, careers, I saw a statistic recently about, you know, the number of, um, how many authors can't get past the third book and, and then, oh, wow. yeah. And then also, you know, when, when careers stall and you can't kind of figure it out and then your parents get sick or your kids come home, yeah. it's really exhausting. The, and so I, and I don't want to beat that drum of women doing all the labor all the time, but women do a lot of the labor all the yeah, time. Yeah. Yep. And, and so they, a lot of them just were like, uh, uncle, I can't do it. Yeah. Lost the, you know, the marketing and yeah. things. So we lost a few, yeah. but um, we're bringing a bunch in and, and we'll get back on our feet again. And it's just kind of a continuous thing. And I love awesome. you know. Talking about women doing all the hard work. <laughs> You wear a lot of different hats, Anne. Um, and I know when you started writing, you like our Patty, you were working as an RN plus teaching yeah. in the health field. What do you have any advice for people who are looking to change careers who who maybe have been writing in secret and they they want to like not make it their secret, dirty secret anymore? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well. For one thing, don't quit your day job until you really do kind of make because I could not quit my day job for a very long time. In fact, I only just retired from the university about a year and a half ago now. So wow. you know, I was yeah. and That's you know, true. that makes it harder. That's for sure. Um, but I guess I would say that first. But the other thing I think that I think what people what new authors I and I would say that this was me too, is that I really thought that people sat down, wrote a book and got it done and sent it out. Like I didn't know how hard it was and I didn't know how much persistence it would take. And I'm sort of built for that because I, I don't know, I, I think that I'm the person that if you need the potatoes carried across the border in Switzerland, I'm probably that person. Like just <laughs> <laughs> 
but I will get them across the border. Um, <laughs> Kristen, and, good to know that. Yeah. You're the human that. embodiment. You're the human embodiment of a great of a of a Pyrenees a Pyrenees. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that okay. is the truth. We all need a great Pyrenees in our lives. Yes, and I'm you're ours. ours. You're yes, ours. Yes, I'm yours. Yeah, I'm your third. <laughs> Great Pyrenees. So, I, and I think that if I were to tell anyone, and I read this early on too, that patience is the number one thing that you have to mm -hmm. have to be an author. And I thought, wow, yeah. that's really true. Yeah. And um, so I think that that patience goes well with not quitting your day job and then just keep going. Right, because um, rejections, rejections are really hard thing to endure, and that's so what hard. that's what's hard for the new young writers, isn't it? Yeah. That, that no one's saying yes, everyone's saying no, and you yeah. don't know why necessarily they're saying mm -hmm. no. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, can't, you don't actually know why, and I it's, so there's a lot of question marks around it, and and the other thing I would say is you know make author friends and get good advice. Yes, that's really what helped me. I I really. I like Christy. I searched out friends and it made a huge difference. Like left yeah. them across tables and things. Yeah. Well, I do too. Like I feel like the reason that I, I allowed was like totally okay with that was not only because she had great skin, but <laughs> I resemble that same thing. Like I'm the same person because I'm so enamored still with authors and they're still oh. my heroes. So if I see them, you know, I feel a little, remember when Rosie O'Donnell was so adorable in the beginning of her talk show and she was always like, oh my God, these people, I still, I feel like that all the time. <laughs> awesome. I feel like that all the time. We get the guests on and I'm like, <gasps> oh, she's yeah. so cool. Yeah. 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 No. Oh, like you, like you. <laughs> I, I'm pretty accessible though. You could probably come to my house and knock on the door. <laughs> yes. Christy's <laughs> like, okay. I'll be there. Don't worry, I'll be there. I have a feeling you're what we call Midwest nice. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm sure she is. She is. I am very Midwest nice. I also, look at that hair thing. I'm also, um, I'm a little bit more Midwest sincere. So maybe that's Wisconsin. Because I think Minnesota can sometimes be Midwest nice without being sincere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, um, we talked about your all the different hats you wear, but you also have a blog that I want to talk about, and it's actually poignant and hilarious, and your essays are so relatable. Absolutely okay. spot on. Me too. So during the pandemic, you wrote about your daughter and living with her, and hilarity ensued. Yeah. Um, I'm really curious. What did you learn from your experience during the pandemic? I mean, I wrote a novel about that, and I'm kind of curious about what you learned as well. And then I have a follow-up after that. Well, I learned a lot, actually. I learned the difference between marketing and um, publicity, because she went <laughs> PR, because she got that <laughs> as a marketing major. But, you know, and this sounds funny, because <laughs> she got a women's studies, um, um, what is it, a minor. She got a women's study minor. Um, because she took one class in women's study and, and was just sort of enthralled with it because she wants to be able to write marketing copy that doesn't make people, women particularly, feel terrible about themselves. And mm -hmm. she said, well, I don't know enough about women's studies to do that. So she took mm -hmm. a class in women's studies and I learned way too much about women's studies. Like, I, I mean, I learned so much that now when I'm watching a movie, I'm like, that's the male gaze, isn't it? You know, oh my <laughs> goodness. <laughs> that's the awesome. male gaze. Yes. Yeah. That's so, awesome. And now I know the authors and I know I read all of her papers and I, you know, helped her edit them. And oh, then I wrote awesome. her, I helped her write her um, graduate school application and she's going to London for graduate school. Oh, so I am now, um, have minored in women's studies. <laughs> <laughs> right at my dining room table. We did the whole thing together. So I was thinking you were going to give us like a life lesson instead. You really learned things yeah. academically. I did. <laughs> I really learned. Yeah. I also learned that, you know, um, I need to not yell at her. <laughs> oh, that's a good <laughs> lesson. Yeah. yeah. So, and um, I, I, we kind of pretty much did that. I mean, there were a couple of times that we kind of lost it, but. Mostly, I just said it's a little like having a muskrat living in your house all the time. Like, <laughs> nothing is in the same place that you put it down. So here you are with doing all these things. How do you balance your life? You've got writing, teaching, tall poppies, a daughter living with you, learning all this stuff. 
How, what does a day look like for Ann Garvin? Ugh. Wow. <laughs> I, I mean, that is, that is, I know, you know, well, I'm, here's what I do every day. I have a new thing. I'm like, well, that didn't work. Let's try this. <laughs> one. Resilience. Yeah, I really spend a lot of time trying to figure out what I'm going to do next. And I'm working on my mm -hmm. edits right now. And they gave me just, they give me like a month. And when they give me a month, it's like boot camp around here. I go to bed at like 8.30, 9 o'clock. I wake up at 4.30. I work like mm -hmm. mad. And then I do, like, I try to work out or walk the dog, and then I do some social media, and then I pick it up again and do it again. But during that time, like, I tell everybody, I can do one thing. I can get the dog groomed, or I can have dinner with you. They can't do both. <laughs> yeah. So when I'm, like, writing a book, it's funny because I wrote books before when I was teaching full-time and had little kids, which I don't know how I did that. Like, I don't remember it, which is probably yeah. a lesson. Yeah. right there it's like you know you won't remember it it's probably good that you don't but now i have a little bit more freedom because i'm not teaching all the time yeah. and um i would just say that i do whatever you know what a lot of women do is that you you sort of consume your life like an elephant elephant one bite at a time all the time yeah right that's but, a really good answer yeah, yeah. but i will that's say that like i am completely devoted <laughs> this is gonna sound funny i'm devoted to sleep and um I make sure that, and I, I run a tight ship around here as far as my health is concerned, because I'm the sleepiest person you've ever met. And if I don't do <laughs> yeah. what I need to do when I'm needing to do it, I get tired. So I'm, I don't know about you guys, but I really have to manage my energy. Yeah, yes. yeah. I totally understand that. <laughs> I, hate, I hate that. I hate having to manage my energy. More and more as the years go by. <laughs> right? yeah. I know. And I'm always talking to the doctor and they're like, well, you're getting older. And I'm like, just what? <laughs> oh, I want a vitamin or a pill I can take. It's I mean, not the right answer. That. Not the right yeah. answer. No. <laughs> and I'm really interested. You know, you had this platform in health and nutrition before <clears throat> you even started writing novels or before, you know, you were published, I guess. And so I'm interested, did that help you? Like, were you able to blend those two worlds, like your writing world and your health and nutrition world in the promotion of your books? Like, did they feed each other? You know, that's such a good question because you have to do that to your chancellor if you decide that you're going to write fiction now all of a sudden and you teach the nutrition <laughs> class. Like they're like, I'm not sure if that is the same scholarly activity. Yeah, but um, what I would say that being, I would say just in terms of being an instructor and being a professor, teaching is telling a story. And so it was easy for me to move from a, a lecturer to a storyteller in terms of like, you know, catching people's interest and then keeping it moving. So that part was great for my writing. As far as, but here's the really interesting thing about this. When I first started writing, I wrote, you know, I, I think I published on Megan's Watch and then I said to my agent at the time, I, you know, I have a PhD and I've been teaching for 30 years in nutrition and health. I'd really like to write small, short, 500 word essays that people can figure out things to do for their health that really make a difference. And she said, you're not qualified. And I said, I'm more qualified than I am to write fiction. And she said, you would need to be Dr. Oz. And so I thought, that's crazy. So I started to put little bits of lessons in my books in dialogue in like one or two lines. Wow, I love that. So that it didn't all go to waste. And now I have a five-minute podcast where I just say everything in five minutes and then I, I sign That's up. That's awesome. I really <laughs> love that. Good for you. <laughs> what a great idea. So great. <laughs> Okay, so we have um, some just kind of quick and easy questions for you. And so I'm going to go first. Okay. Who would you invite to your fantasy dinner party? You guys. Hey. Uh, <laughs> yes, obviously. I should have said besides us. <laughs> Are you looking for an author or just anybody? Any, than anybody. You know who I want? I want to meet Francis McDormand. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Awesome. I can see that. I mean, there's oh. a, there's many men I would like to meet for other reasons, but it's just <laughs> in terms of like an amazing woman, I think she must be amazing. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. All right, she so seems amazing. Yeah. If you could give yourself one piece of advice to your youngest self, who, 
what would that be to your younger self? What would it be? Oh, I think I'd say don't sleep with so many people. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> Well, that's a good one. <laughs> you don't really need to quite so much, maybe. I think. <laughs> oh my God, I'm, that's going in a book. I don't care. Oh, that is so so much. Much. <laughs> we just had that answer on the show. So <laughs> I just think that we cut, it, cut it there. I mean, does it? It can't get better than that. All right. <laughs> if, if you had one, if you had a one-year all-expense-paid trip to write anywhere in the world, where would you go, in? Oh. Oh That's my cool. God, Bali. I think I'd go to Bali. Oh, but don't, wow. don't sleep with too many people there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hard. What is this? Oh, no, you feel like it would be really hard. Isn't that, that what eating like off is all about? <laughs> your two goals are going to be at odds if you go to Bali. Oh, no, yeah. <clears throat> I still think that Bali, for one thing, the flight is like 22 hours. It would take you a year to recover. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. true. Good point. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But I okay. would like to go there. Okay, and what inspires you? Oh, you know what? Um, this is, sounds corny, but I really love a good weirdo. And <laughs> um, so do we. Yeah. No, I love no, them. I, when I see something that is just quirky, yeah, bizarre, I know I have to write so much backstory to support it so everybody doesn't hate them, but I, <laughs> I just love a good yeah. nut. And um, I really love to bring those people out so that everybody else who's got a little nuttiness feels a little bit better about being a nut. I love it. Cute. Everybody is kind of a weirdo. We are. Yes, we are. Our inner, weirdos are. our inner weirdos are just right below the surface waiting to come out. Exactly. We are, I think. Yeah. And thank God. Yeah. Yeah. Sanity is way overrated. Oh, um, totally. And what's coming up next for you? So the edit Bali. I besides that, it's Bali. <laughs> I am, um, you know, lately what I so this is um this success of this book and having a publisher who's sort of into me um is a new thing for me. I you know, I've been dumped by a couple of publishers and I've worked my way through a few agents. And um just to have this consistency with somebody who gets awesome. humor and so I'm so excited that I have a book coming up and then I just pitched another one and I, I feel a little bit like, okay, like this is great and I can do this and I'm here to stay a little bit more than I felt before. That's so awesome. that's a really great feeling for me. I love nice. that. Well, can you tell us about the book you're working on or is it top secret? No, it's not. It's not. I'm sure I talk, I talk about everything, you know. Um, <laughs> It's um, it's called falling in love is the easy part, and it's really not just about. It's not really as much about romance as it is falling in love with yourself, falling in love with your life, falling oh. in love with your career. And you know oh, how it is that. when you fall in love right away, and you're like, oh, this is really great, but really the rest of it is the work, and you have to figure out that you really do love that or not. Yeah. So it's three women of three different generations who bond together in an airplane. Um, you know how you do that sometimes, like it's yeah, and it's three. Oh, yeah three women that could all be each other at some point in their lives. And um, they they bond there in the airplane together and each of them think they know why they're going to New York City. And in the middle of a oh, blackout, wow. everything kind of changes everything. So. Oh, wow. oh, that's um, very cool. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds I amazing. Love I love that. I hope it's funny. <laughs> sure it will <laughs> be. It cannot help but be I have with no you, doubt. Yeah. No doubt. So, Anne, is there is there anything that you've been reading lately that you think we should all be reading? Well, I yes, I read. So, I read three things just like super recently, okay. and one of them is, and I never say her name right, but El Cosamino. That, um, and I always get the name wrong. Maggie Finley is it's not Maggie Finley. Finley Donovan. It's killing it. It's oh, yeah, so yeah. funny, and it's so well plotted. And um, really, so well done. And then I read um, Jocelyn Jackson's Mother May I. Yeah. And, oh my gosh. I mean, yeah. it's really like kind of watching a master at work when you're yeah. so good. And then I read um, Hillary Mandel, you know, The Glass Hotel. I mm. think that was it. And yeah. I love that too. I mean, I was really lucky. I, all three books I picked up in a row were just home runs. It's awesome when that happens. And I'm working on your yeah. guys. I have them all. I was like, Megan, get the book. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Everybody's books. 
I love it. Um, well, thank you so much. All right, so stick around for another minute if you would, because we have one more question for you. But before we go, we wanted to remind all of you out there about just a few things. So first of all, did you know that Friends in Fiction has partnered with Oxford Exchange to offer exclusive Friends in Fiction merchandise? We are offering adorable soft t-shirts, wine sippies, and coffee tumblers, and we have more great products on the way. And supporting independent booksellers is only one way, but such an important way of, of supporting your community and keep it up and running. And this week, my favorite, Blue Bicycle Books, is offering 10% off all our new releases. And we hope you'll really support Anindi. And this is including, I thought you said this would work, this great new book by our guest tonight with Codes Friends. And don't forget, if you haven't yet, to subscribe to our Friends in Fiction podcast, Writer's Block, with our friend Ron Block. Not only can you listen to any of our Wednesday night episodes, but we will also be dropping a brand new episode every single Friday. This week, our Ron will be chatting with Stephen Rowley, which is so cool, PJ so Vernon, cool. and Virginia Willis in celebration of Pride Month. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And once again, we're always grateful to our partner, Mama Geraldine's, whose cheese straws and cookies we adore, and Story Point Wines for our Wednesday night sip and stay after show. All right, Anne, back to you now. Um, before you go, we would love a writing tip from a successful novelist and writing teacher. And I just like a little nutrition advice. I just think. <laughs> <laughs> 40, 40, and, and before and before you answer that, Anne, what is the name of your blog so everybody can hear the name of your blog? Mm -hmm. it's Come called, sit by me. Come sit. Come sit by me. That's it's right. a Such a genius my, name. Podcast. Such yeah. a genius. Mm -hmm. name. Thank you. Um, my writing tip, I would say, is um, well, I don't know. I think my writing tip is the same that it always is, is that you really have to figure out what your character wants. And then once you do, your character will tell you the rest of the story. Mm, ah. Yeah, I think yeah. that you just kind of follow them around and watch them try to get it. And then you knock them over. Yeah. Again, and again. <laughs> again and again. Again and again. That's so true. Yeah. That's a really, really great answer. Thank you. I love that. Yeah. Well, and we want to thank you so much for joining us. To everyone out there, don't forget to pick up the brand new I Thought You Said This Would Work and follow Anne on her website, annegarvin.net. And I also wanted to just remind everyone, this is launch week for Mary Alice's The Islanders. So if you have not picked it up yet, it is an amazing middle grade read. Um, <laughs> and all the kids in your life are going to love it. So thank you to all of you out there for joining us tonight for this very special behind the book bonus episode of Friends in Fiction. We'll see you Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern with Marie Benedict and Victoria Christopher Murphy. See you then. Good night. Good night, Anne. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And please, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Good night.